welcome back to the China Puzzle. I'm going to get straight back into our discussion with our speakers, Professor Kerry Brown and Richard Graham, MP. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on one of the major, I guess, exercises of Chinese power this year, which has been in the introduction of the national security laws in Hong Kong. Why did China introduce these new security laws and what impact does it have on the people of Hong Kong? I think the central government's attitude towards Hong Kong has definitely hardened and we're effectively 23 years into the handover era. In theory, it's meant to be one country systems to 2047. Uh, to be honest, I think China's attitude has been increasingly, there's one country and the two systems is an optional extra if you're well behaved. So the protests over the last two or three years that really intensified in 2019, I think really hit a nerve with Beijing, which is this sort of spectrum of instability. You know, well, from your work in China and with China, that stability is the big premium, you know, stability must be preserved. This is a country that, you know, really has a fear of instability from its history and also its more recent experiences. And so seeing Hong Kong perpetually protesting as happened over the last summer was something I think the central leadership decided they were going to deal with. And they didn't use the military. That would have been an absolute nuclear option. So they didn't, despite speculation at the time, send the People's Liberation Army in. But I think they've been opportunistic. COVID-19 has given them the opportunity to do what they've done. And the national security law, I think, has been a symbolic move for them to sort of totally assert Beijing's prime power over Hong Kong. What is its impact in Hong Kong? I think it has created, so I think Hong Kong is divided. The last elections at the end of last year were most in support of pro-democracy parties, um, not pro-Beijing parties. Although there are important constituencies in the city that are very, very keen to keep close to Beijing and be loyal to Beijing. So there are divisions in the city and there are divisions even amongst those that oppose the central government, some wanting independence and some wanting something much, much softer. So I think what we have seen is a kind of, um, you know, a sort of uneasy pact at the moment, again, because of COVID-19. I suspect the Hong Kong is not going to go away. Uh, it's not so much the international community, because I think China doesn't really listen to that anymore. But it is the, the sort of anomaly of a place which is actually culturally quite different from the rest of China, and yet is increasingly brought into the same governance template. What damage has the Hong Kong security law done to China's reputation internationally? And is this something that President Xi should be or is concerned about? Those are two very interesting questions. Um, look, I think that when it comes to uh, issues around security and definitions of treason and so on, uh, I think for Xi Jinping, it, it's not an area where he's terribly interested in, in compromise and, and making sort of exceptions and doesn't really want um, demonstrations in Hong Kong to sort of encourage others in the mainland to, to, to follow suit. And that's all of that is understandable. For what it's worth, I've always said um, the tragic thing about all of this is that it was all avoidable. There was a moment uh, around six years ago when universal suffrage was on the table for the election of the chief executive. It should have been taken and uh, what should have then followed would have been universal suffrage for the LegCo elections. And therefore these arguments would have been uh, taking place really around the time of the, of the ballot box and during the polls in elections rather than on the streets, which is where you drive uh, people with political views to if they have no other political outlet. But that, that's a historical footnote. Um, we know where we are. The crucial thing is firstly that um, it does have an impact on, on China's uh, international reputation, no doubt about that. It's a price she may be uh, happy to pay at the moment. But it also, of course, sends a very clear message to people's assumptions about Taiwan. Because if there was ever a feeling in the West that the whole point of one country, two systems was to be a vehicle which would be attractive to Taiwan, uh, effectively what's happening here is that China is... 
uh, I'm afraid, showing that uh, commitment to one country, two systems is rather more on the one country than the two systems. So everyone will have to reflect quite carefully on that and what the implications are. The crucial things for China's diplomacy is that Firstly, the sort of wolf warrior stuff, you know, lots of am ambassadors giving out very angry messages and describing countries like Australia as a bit of chewing gum under the foot and arguments with the front page of the German newspaper, the Norwegian ambassador, you know, you name it. it, it it's, it's, it's not a good idea. And I think they've rumbled that, you know, having an argument with every country in the, in the democratic world simultaneously uh, as, as sort of having a bit of fighting with Indian soldiers on their border, tiffs in the South China Sea and so on. It, it's, it's not a good position for China to be in. And that's why I think we've seen a toning down of that type of diplomacy. And uh, China, in my view, needs to really fine tune her diplomacy to a modern era where she is a much more important international player and, and to, to be a bit less prickly, a bit less sensitive and a bit more give and take in her relationships with, with other countries. And I think that would, that would serve her well. And from the West's point of view, um, I, I think there is a lot of work to be done about understanding where we go in our relationships on, on some of these sensitive issues. You talked a lot about diplomacy and that's clearly something lacking, I think, between both Australia and China at the moment, the US and China, obviously. Um, one of the issues that's come to the fore and really heated up the Australia-China relationship is the expulsion or the extrication of uh, its final two foreign correspondents a few weeks ago. What messaging does China's expulsion of foreign journalists from the country send to the rest of the world? So again, I think this is part of the sort of inevitable clash of cultures uh, and values. Um, you know, dissent is not tolerated within China. Political dissent, political writing, you know, people are, are, are closed down very fast. And, um, and that wasn't always the way. There was a space, a good space, um, several years ago, and, and, it, and it ran for quite a long time, where there were all sorts of thoughtful individuals, organizations, think tanks, and so on in China, who did have and could have, were licensed to have, if you like, very thoughtful, wide-ranging discussions with foreigners on a whole range of issues, where there wasn't just one view in China about what the right way forward was. And, and they were happy to explore and to accept, to some extent, constructive criticism from the West, which wasn't necessarily always right and wasn't necessarily always wrong. Uh, but it was a way of, of discussing and debate that's very familiar. It's a strong part of our culture, especially, obviously, in this workplace where I am, is you debate things, you discuss them. And our starting point, which is a very hard one for Chinese Communist Party to understand, I think, is that I may disagree with everything Kerry has to say if he's an opposition politician, but I would defend to the death his right to say that. You know, that's not a starting point for the People's Republic of China. And so, you know, foreign journalists writing critical articles, there's always going to be a temptation to close them down and boot them out. But what it will lead to, I'm afraid, is inevitably more speculation because the sources of information will be less trustworthy, less, if you like, auditable. And, uh, uh, and so things will get out one way or another things always do get out and personally I think it's always better to try and bring people into your system it's what I try and encourage my colleagues to do here some of whom have a very blinkered approach to China is I try and encourage them to sort of learn more about China understand where she's coming from why that century of humiliation is such an important part of their narrative and, and history and likewise I think you know for China to actually encourage really good journalists to spend time in China um, is, is actually a positive thing for China, even if occasionally they say things the ruling party doesn't always love. That, I'm afraid, is part of the relation. Absolutely. Kerry, do you agree? I mean, what sort of impact does it have for a global audience wanting to access information on what's happening in China on the ground if there are no foreign correspondents based there? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, every day I ask myself 
um, how much I could agree more with what Richard says. So I, I, I'm always sort of very, very happy to, 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 uh, to agree. I, I mean, I think, um, so it is not great uh, because of COVID-19, um, because of these expulsions, that we have probably had less contact between um, uh, China you know now than we probably did i mean i think even in the cultural revolution there were australian journalists there i think from the early 70s so now i think there are no australian journalists based in china that is not super great um and i mean american journalists too i mean the wall street journal uh, or the um i think the earliest one to open was in the late 1970s with frank ching and now you know not to have significant newspapers having a presence there i mean that was not true when things were really really bad in in the 70s so uh, you know, for academics, because of COVID, we don't go at the moment. Um, I'm not sure how easy it is going to be to go there after this is all over, hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. soon. Um, you know, the two Canadians that were taken in um, because of the Huawei issue, well, <laughs> not because of the Huawei issue, the Chinese government says, but, you know, the kind of, uh, they've been in prison now for nearly two years. Um, this is not a great message to send. It's not in anyone's interest, yeah. in China's interest or the world's interest to have people you know journalists um academics uh students researchers not able to go to each other's places this is this is going to mean a really big problem for our dialogue and i think um it's particularly problematic at the moment because we need to know more about china um we're making decisions about china because of covid although we uh, politicians and policy makers um, you know, have a lot of emotions probably sometimes about issues that come from China. Getting the facts right is really important. And what I've been struck by in the discussions I've been involved in in America and Europe and the UK is once you get through the initial sort of, you know, uh, I guess political statements, that, that they'll always happen. People are trying to work out how do we deal with the situation at the moment where a really vast and important economy has fundamentally different values to ours. That is a practical issue. Um, we need to work a way of saying, okay, on these issues, climate change, pandemics, uh, growth, we have a similar language. So let's work together on these issues. I'm sorry, we, we, we just can't, you know, we, we have to stick by our identity, our values too. Um, and I, I think just, just finally, you know, on the, say, say university, I'm in a university, right? I mean, uh, opportunistically China has been accused of trying to interfere in universities and maybe that's because universities were naive or whatever but it is in no one's interest that universities be seen to be partisan in this um, it is in everyone's interest that people like me can go around and irritate everyone because I'm going to say, you know, uh, this is, you know, sort of I agree with that and I don't agree with that. I mean, people sitting in the middle is important, even though we're not popular. And I think, um, you know, th th this message needs to be conveyed to China that universities are um, they're not maybe friends, but they're certainly not enemies. This is not an either or, you know, having mm. people who can say, we need to work with China on climate change, for instance. I mean, the Xi Jinping statement last week at the UN, very positive, you know, China being yeah. calm and neutral in 2060. This is big. This is a big piece of news. And yet you saw the Pew Research survey coming out yesterday. Throughout the world, China's reputation has taken a terrible nosedive. This is not good. The world's second biggest economy, uh, a fifth of humanity, having a reputational issue is not good. And I think, you know, we need to have a neutral space urgently. And if we don't have journalists based there and others trying to get information that people can assess, uh, then this is going to be a really nasty conflict. Um, yeah. not, a, not a war, but a conflict. We need to avoid that. Yeah, I mean, those are absolutely on, on, on the mark comments, Anna. It's very dangerous having two people on a panel who broadly agree on so much. But, um, you know, we could split a few hairs from time to time over a few beers or something. But, but th those are fundamentally right comments. And, and I think the interesting thing is, there's a very good, I think, book recently done on China by Michael Wood, who is um, a professor mm. of public policy up in Manchester, and wears his, his learning very lightly. And he spoke at my Gloucester History Festival, um, about China and on the book. It's, uh, you can see it on gloucesterhistoryfestival.co.uk. It's a very good 20-minute talk from him. And then he takes questions. 
and and you will not get a stronger sinophile in this country than Michael. He's absolutely fascinated by uh, ancient poets, philosophers, Confucius, the impact that this has had on Chinese people and the way the country has evolved. Nobody could be more steeped in it all. But when asked the question on this issue of academic and journalistic freedoms and so on, he does make it very clear that he regrets the fact that there seems to have been a shrinking inwards, a reduction of that space where we could all have a dialogue uh, in non-confrontational terms uh, with people who wanted to exchange ideas and so on. And that's really important that that carries on. Um, as Kerry says, we have to reinvent that space so that we can coexist even where there are big differences. The important thing in this whole debate to stress though is that China is not going to disappear, right? Okay, I, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a fact we have to deal with. And I think I hear a lot of language in the UK, which is a bit wishful, you know, that um, we do this, we do that, and China will sort of drop into line. We're dealing with a very, maybe a hubristic leadership, yeah? I mean, I, I mean, maybe that's the problem, that Xi Jinping, it, it, the leadership is incredibly overconfident. But when they see what's happening in America at the moment, uh, maybe some of the things in Europe, and they see how we've handled COVID, they feel emboldened. I mean, maybe they're wrong, but they feel emboldened. It, it, it's really symptomatic, I think, of a, a, a kind of, you know, a confluence of two things. One, China feeling economically stronger and stronger, and the politics at the moment, particularly in America, looking very, very vexed and weak. And I mean, that's not good for anyone. So th these, are, these are dangerous times. And yeah, I mean, that's the next a, few that's weeks is um, good, really important. Good. And those are very good points. There's no doubt about it. If you're watching Western politics from a Chinese perspective, you know, you, you would be appalled at some of the, the things going on. And, you know, for us here in the United Kingdom, we need to make sure that we still have a United Kingdom, not a disunited kingdom. Um, you know, that, 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 that is the sort of issue where we need to get our own house into order. And we all need to get our houses in order after the pandemic anyway. We've taken on debt and nationalized industries in a way that I wouldn't have imagined any conservative government would have even blinked at, you know, even dreamt of doing in its worst nightmare. So we, we got to get our act together. But in amongst all this, um, I, I think it's important that, that, that China doesn't become, as Kerry says, too hubristic on this, too overconfident, um, and underestimates the sort of resilience of the West and the way it can come together when it feels threatened. And on our side, um, we need to be trying to do things and encourage relationships where China wants to do things more our way because it's attractive and beneficial to the Chinese people and the nation for them to do so, rather than just because we're telling them that's the way it is. Uh, superiority on both sides is a mistake. When do you think that this shift occurred uh, in terms of the way that China and the UK are viewing each other in more adversarial terms? I think the 2008 economic crisis really was, uh, I did have a profound impact because I think it uh, shifted perceptions in Beijing of our competence. Uh, and I think since then, the Xi Jinping leadership in a sense in 2012 grew from that sense of confidence and has built on it. You're right, things in Hong Kong, uh, also, you know, kind of political issues, the Trump presidency and all the sort of things that have happened have really fitted that narrative. But I think 2008 is the big, the big kind of the shift. The Beijing Olympics was the sort of prof, but underneath it was the, the profound impact on confidence in the financial systems and in, in the sort of orders underpinning them, uh, you know, kind of uh, in our kind of econ economy. And I think that's probably when China sort of thought, wow, they don't have the answers and we can do capitalism better than them. <laughs> So that's really interesting. And I think there's, there's quite a lot in that. And of course, indirectly, that also caused a, a shift of approach here in the UK. You could see the, the Osborne in particular, but the Cameron Osborne axis fundamentally decided that we would go hell for leather on a program of attracting significant foreign direct investment from China that that was the one country where if you focused on, you could achieve significant flows quite fast because we could provide access to sectors that they wouldn't be able to get access to elsewhere in the West. But that in turn led to a, a, a slight backlash uh, after that government came to an end, really after the Brexit referendum. 
So on our side, I think the mood music has been responding, if you like, to the changes that Carrie described in Beijing and Xi Jinping's greater confidence, uh, the, the belief that actually he can now challenge America openly and publicly with Trump there, that this was a turning point. I think that has gradually led to a, a reassessment, particularly of uh, the direction of travel, where this is all leading to, and whether opening us up as widely as we did to all sorts of foreign investment was necessarily the right strategy from a security point of view. So there have been a number of things that I think have come together, but you're right also, Nick, to mention Hong Kong, because that is a sort of emotional issue here in the UK. Again, to have a conservative government implicitly offer British nationality to you know, several million Hong Kong Chinese in an era where one of the reasons for leaving the EU was because of open immigration, you know, is a remarkable thing, but it's very popular, being no doubt about that. It's a very popular offer. Um, and that demonstrates the, the depth of the emotional commitment, which I don't think China wants to sort of recognize or is understandably is not very interested in. So all of these things have slightly come together. Um, and that's why finding things like COP15 and COP26 where actually hooray we've got shared interests in the same planet and we can come together and do something special could be exciting and this could be an example where china could actually help us to make sure that the us is in the right space so that would be a, a global positive in turn china's influence on the globe is undeniable concerns about the depths and reach of Ch the chinese communist party are valid from its people to its autonomous regions and even over the companies born within its borders. The message is clear, however, China has much to offer the world from its rich cultural history to its thriving modern economy. The UK must be unflinching and forthright in confronting its vast political differences with China. To encourage a more constructive debate across Western democracies, China needs to improve transparency and be willing to make concessions and work pragmatically with other countries. We are a long way from finding the right balance on China, but engaging in a productive debate that avoids polarization is one step closer to finding the middle ground. <laughs>